Welcome. Thank you for joining our Best Practice Series webinar. I'm Becky Melody, your hostess for today's presentation. Brian Coddington, USDM VP of Cloud Technology, David Blewett, USDM VP of Cloud Compliance, and Florent Umeri, CEO of 123 Compliance, will be presenting. The discussion today will cover introductions, webinar logistics, and our discussion topic, Turning Your Life Sciences Company into a Connected Enterprise. We have a strong presentation, uh, presentation team for you today. Please meet David Blewett. He's our VP of Cloud Compliance. And uh, David is an accomplished life sciences regulatory and IS compliance professional with extensive hands-on and leadership experience in the pharmaceutical, medical device, biotech, and blood management industries. We're also proud to have uh, Brian Coddington leading the USDM Cloud Technology team. For almost a decade, Brian has been a senior executive in the cloud space with in-depth knowledge of sales, marketing, and service, and support processes and best practices as well. He's known for helping companies maximize their investments in cloud-based application. Florent E. Mary, CEO of 123 Compliance, offers more than 14 years of experience in the life sciences and healthcare industries. Florent brings direct knowledge and expertise of software organization leadership, development, implementation, and of course validation. USDM focuses exclusively on the life sciences domain. We're the market leader in providing quality and regulatory IT compliance professional service solutions. We're a compliance partner for many best of breed vendors, including Oracle, Salesforce.com, and SAP. We're headquartered in Santa Barbara, California, and we've delivered more than 1,000 successful projects with over 300 life science clients. We offer hands-on experience existing clients under regulatory distress, and we're the market leader for validation accelerator packs. Our various dedicated practices include global quality and auditing, IT and virtualization, life sciences cloud, UDI track and trace practice, our GRC practice, the laboratory practice which includes systems and equipment, enterprise content management, enterprise resource planning, product lifecycle management, enterprise quality management, manufacturing, automation and equipment, clinical and, and drug safety, business intelligent, intelligence, excuse me, project management, and of course our CRM management practice. We're very proud to be partnering with uh, 123 Compliance. They are focused exclusively on life sciences, and their leadership combined, they have 50 years of experience in life science business and technology implementations. They focus on innovation and bringing new solutions to market, and they're current, uh, currently a leader in cloud-based quality and compliance applications. They have customers in the top 10 pharma and med dev companies, and they are a leading life science partner for Salesforce.com. Our webinar today will be um, covered in approximately 30 minutes. We'll share the content for you. And then I uh, invite you to post any questions for the team via the message board, which you'll find on the lower left of your screen. You can also join us on the LinkedIn discussion boards and post any questions there. Or of course, if your question is of a confidential nature, just shoot us a note and we can work with you offline at USDM, USDM.com. Thank you again for taking the time to join our team today. And with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Brian. Thanks, Becky. Hi, everybody. This is Brian Coddington with USDM. And uh, on the agenda for today, we're going to be talking about what is a connected enterprise, then connected enterprise for patients, providers, and employees. We'll talk about cloud platform, and compliance advances. We'll look at customer service 
field service and QMS in a validated cloud system. We'll also be talking about how you get started with some of these concepts. And then we'll have time for Q&A. All right. So next, uh, I'd like to rent your Mary. He's going to be talking about what is a connected enterprise. Thanks, Brian. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Florent um, with One Street Appliance. And so, um, a connected enterprise is essentially, uh, you know, a natural extension. And what we mean by that is a natural extension of the QA regulatory and safety processes to the both internal and external customers of a company. So uh, what that means is you know, uh, closer integration with, with the customer, which for a lot of life science companies is providers, patients, uh, distributors, um, and also closer connection to uh, other external customers like uh, suppliers and uh, uh, suppliers and vendors, and then um, a better connection of all the internal customers uh, from customer service, sales, field service, uh, with uh, with the quality uh, regulatory um, um, departments and uh, and investigation lab analysis departments. So um, as an example of this, and I think we'll be talking uh, about this uh, later on, as an example of this would be a complaint handling and or an adverse event system or an adverse event process. Um, you know, these are typically a uh, complaint handling system is typically an extension of customer service. You know, customers call the company for a variety of reasons. But some of those reasons are, you know, raise a flag and they become complaints or they become adverse events. And then, you know, other parts of the company, uh, other departments sort of step in and uh, work on this process. Um, and, you know, and the, the intake of, you know, uh, some of these uh, um, uh, items of some of these complaints or adverse events can come both from the customer but also come from internal uh, 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 people on the company think of uh, salespeople that go and visit the customers, or think field service people that actually go to service devices, let's say. So um, you can see that you know uh, these processes are really integrated with each other. And nowadays, the technology is there to actually have better integration of these processes. There was always a need to have these processes, you know better connect and better talk to each other, but now the technology is following that. And uh, technology for this is typically in the cloud right now. So, so um, uh, you know, let's, uh, if you look uh, further on this, you'll see that over the past few years, the, the cloud platforms um, have, you know, uh, taken a huge leap uh, from where they were, let's say, 10 years ago. Um, you know, one of the things that um, um, uh, you might be aware of, but we have, you know, become aware uh, very strongly uh, uh, lately, is that um, lots of life science companies, uh, both the pharma, device, biotech, food, uh, food companies as well, have um, moved into the cloud, but not just, you know, sort of commercial processes. Uh, we're talking about quality and regulatory related processes. And uh, the reason typically is, you know, th there are several reasons, but a big reason is that this giant leap in functionality that exists right now on the, on the cloud. Uh, there's a giant leap in functionality and also this sort of um, natural interconnectedness interconnect that uh, these cloud platforms provide to both internal and external customers of uh, quality regulatory and safety. So on the on-premise side, you know, um, uh, the, the trend is that there's been, you know, the, 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 big, uh, the big thing to, to notice on the on-premise side has been little, you know, innovation and investment. And, you know, the func um, and they've fallen behind quite a bit on the functionality, on the upgradability. And then themselves moving to the cloud, um, uh, I think uh, it, it's been difficult for the on-premise, current on-premise uh, uh, solutions to move to the cloud, and, um, and I think it will be difficult for, for them going forward. So, um, with that said, um, you know, where do we see the industry going forward? 
uh, and what's the path forward? I think you know it's it's clear uh, right now with um, the technology is there for these life science companies to actually achieve what they have been wanting to do for a long time. Uh, basically, have better connection uh, to their customers, uh, providers, patients and uh, suppliers and their own manufacturing and their own internal processes. And you know, we live in a different world where um, you know, uh, we never thought that we could do so much on our mobile devices. We never thought that we could do so much on our, you know, on our uh, browser uh, to begin and, and how much we can be connected you know, from our browser and from our mobile devices. So uh, I think that the uh, the technology has made a giant leap, and it's finally basically giving the businesses what they have always wanted uh, over these years. And with that, I will um, uh, uh, pass it uh, back to Brian to give you sort of some more background on how much uh, sort of the industry and technology has changed, and the and expectation of customers has changed over time. Yeah, thanks, Blumen. So, the, the connected enterprise, and you know, where does this all lead? You know, down to the customers and employees, right? So, uh, some of the numbers I'm going to be talking about. These are actually just captured. They're very recent uh, from a, a survey done by Salesforce, and they found that today, the average American with healthcare sees his or her doctor three times a year. It has 2.5 doctors overseeing their care. Okay, so we're all familiar with this. We all go to the doctor and make appointments and physically go there, so we can get a checkup or you know have our health evaluated, uh, whatever it is that we're doing. So the uh, the study found that 60% of millennials, uh, those in the 18 to 34 year old range are interested in using telehealth options. An example of that would be video chat with a doctor so they don't have to come into the office for an appointment. 71% of that group would be interested in a doctor providing or a pro doctor or provider giving them a mobile app on their smartphone or tablet to actively manage their well-being for preventative care, review health records, and schedule appointments. Okay? That's that's interesting. Uh, you know, these patients um, are really looking for ways to not have to go into a doctor's office, uh, that they can use their smartphones and tablets to manage their well-being for preventative care and access to health records and for scheduling visits when they do have to go in. And what that means is that as a connected enterprise, you need to, you need to have this data ready to extend out to your customers and not in a silo you know, accessible only to, to those uh, internal folks. Um, last bullet point, you know, these are not only the customers of tomorrow, but also the employees of life sciences companies. They will want and expect to work in these types of connected environments. Okay, that's just kind of what I was going into is that your, as a connected enterprise, your employees are, and suppliers and partners, they are going to expect to work in this fashion. And if you're um, using older technology and not able to have this new functionality, you're not able to extend your data out to the mobile device. Um, you're not integrating with other systems and, and having all that data available then you're going to be stuck um, not providing the best service to your patients or suppliers and also not telling the best story to your employees and keeping the best talent on staff. Okay, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to David Blewett who will be talking about uh, why it makes sense to move to the cloud now. All right, thanks Brian. Uh, this is David Blewett. Um, I just wanted to talk about recently the, the FDA themselves uh, have been recognizing the power of the cloud and they're leveraging it for their, their big data initiatives to enable storage and analysis and sharing of 
enormous data sets and, and also to upgrade their te technology platforms in line with current and future requirements. Uh, these data sets, they're not only you know, larger than ever before, they're also arriving more frequently than ever and varying enormously in format and quality. This year alone, they're expecting to receive over two, excuse me, 2 million submissions uh, through their e-submissions gateway. And some of those are as large as one terabyte in size. Um, with cloud computing, obviously, it stores data on the internet rather than on hard drives or uh, drives of computers and single servers. So it lends itself to the uh, ongoing and simultaneous capacity to collect and control and to analyze enormous data sets. And you can only really do that with the cloud initiatives. So em embracing the power um, of, of the cloud and what it provides you, both legacy cloud platforms and, and those being considered for new or, or upgraded implementations within life sciences companies, uh, they can now be taken the extra step to take advantage of the, the huge power and configurability of the cloud. And at the same time, they can be shown uh, to be compliant with the FDA's regulatory expectations. And this has done, been done in numerous uh, biosciences firms to date. So with only a minor adaptation of, of best practice methodologies like GAMP5 and the risk-based approach to, to compliant GSP systems, uh, these have been tried and tested for many years and are now being used at more and more life sciences companies to qualify and validate and to maintain cloud platforms and accompanying GXP applications and the mobile devices that, that can be used with them. So you, you can see that this, uh, this cloud, cloud validation is not something new and it's something that's been embraced already, but it is still in its infancy, uh, but it's certainly nothing to be afraid of. So now I'm going to hand back over to Clarent and he's going to talk about some interesting case studies. Uh, thank you. So, um, you know, like, like I mentioned before, I want to give you an example um, on basically how, uh, you know, one of the uh, current life science companies are are utilizing um, uh, cloud uh, platforms and uh, cloud technology to uh, connect better um, the customers to their internal processes, uh, and you know, essentially have um, uh, more easily and uh, uh, more easily maintain compliance. So, you know. Uh, you know, a typical this is a typical complaint uh, system for a device company. So, um, a Topcon Medical System, um, they're a medical device company based. Uh, uh, they are headquarters in Japan. They are, uh, um, this specific uh, is their uh, specific implementation is their uh, U.S. division, which is just based in New Jersey, and they collect customer complaints. Uh, and customer complaints come from a variety of sources. They come from customers themselves. They come from their field, uh, field service staff. Comes from the uh, salespeople, and um, they need to collect this information. They need to fix whatever issue the customer is having. They need to determine how serious the issue is, and and whether they need to um, uh, do reporting, MDR reporting. And then also, you know, looking at the complaints and the trends, they have to uh, do corrective actions. So it's a you know typical complaint process. Um, so what does this this mean? Um, this means you know, uh, like I said before, the complaints um, and reporting are extension of customer service. They are already uh, uh, in touch with the customer. They know what the customer is experiencing. And then uh, they can uh, quickly use the technology uh, to maintain contact with the customer, come to the root cause of the problem, fix it, and then you know issue corrective action so that you know these uh, any possible issues don't you know repeat or you know typical uh, corrective action process. So um, you know a lot of the processes happen outside the company. They you know. Uh, happening in the field, uh, so the salespeople, the, the field service people, they, um, you know, it's difficult in a lot of places to take your, um, uh, you know, laptop, open it up, you know, find an internet connection, uh, find Wi-Fi, and then you know, uh, do you know the data entry, and you know, uh, it's always a struggle, uh, you know, it's a struggle for a lot of the life science companies to sort of. Um, have their field service staff uh, sort of report any any issues that they see on the field. 
Uh, but you know, technology is there right now that you can use a mobile phone and then quickly do any data collection that you need to do, and then that it's automatically connected with your complaint handling system or your, your service system, or service and complaint handling system, and then you know. Uh, uh, you can raise the flags there and then uh, handle the complaint there. So you know, um, so TopCon had to make a choice. What do they want to do about this? They wanted to have mobile capability, cloud capability, and did not want to invest in um, infrastructure. And then a big part is upgrades. So you know, um, I have been uh, I have participated in plenty of upgrade projects. That the only reason that those upgrades happen is because the software is running out of support, and you need to, you know, write up, you know, uh, a lot, a lot of documentation and go through a lot of validation, just, you know, uh, for for very little return on investment. There is, you know, not much business business uh, gets out of this upgrade. It's strictly to maintain sort of, you know. Um, the serviceability of, of that of that tool. So they didn't want to do that. So TopCon, what uh, TopCon did, they picked the cloud platform to handle um, a lot of these customer facing processes uh, and internal processes together. So that means customer service, field service, complaint handling, and tapas. They reported, they implemented this, they reported 35% increase in productivity. They uh, definitely it's much lower TCL. And the implementation was was far faster. Um, it's um, you know, and this is all with a cloud platform where they never had to install a server. They just turn it on, and then you know they um, with the uh, help of uh, USBM, they were able to uh, do the validation, uh, and and then they they went live. So it was um, compared to you know. A lot of the implementation that we've been part of, it was uh, far uh, far easier. So with that said, um, I will uh, on the next slide, I will pass this uh, back to Brian, uh, who can uh, who will talk about uh, how to get started with this. Yeah, thanks, Brian. So yeah, those of you on the call might be thinking, okay, great. Connected enterprise, I get it. Um, what do I do now? So, you know, you need to often have make the business case with management. You, know, um, you have an existing application in place; maybe it's working. Uh, how do you how do you make the case to bring in something new? And um, a main reason would be to update your legacy or on-premise application. A lot of these older systems are tough to enhance. It's not easy to improve the functionality of those systems. Maybe the person that was maintaining that application is no longer there, and you've kind of inherited this system. Um, you know, I've seen legacy systems where it takes a day to build a new report, and in cloud systems. Today, it would take only a few minutes to drag and drop and, and click your way through the creation of a, of a report. That's a great reason uh, to add your business case for building your connected enterprise. Shorter implementation time. You know, in, in the case study that Laurent just went through, there, the time to implement that solution was much shorter than it would it had been in the past and with an on-premise application. You're not buying hardware. You're not sizing all the you know your your database and your storage and all the other things that have to go into uh, doing something on-premise. That also leads to lower cost for maintenance and ongoing enhancements. Yes, you are paying a license fee for a cloud system. Uh, but it's based on the number of users that are using it. You're not having to build out this large system and and pay for all the hardware and everything that goes along with that. Integration is much simpler. Moving data in and out of the cloud system, there are pre-built connectors 
and APIs. You're not having to write a lot, a lot of this from scratch. So as you look to build out your connected enterprise and bring in different systems and do data mashups or, or you know, be able to have reports from many different systems, not just one, that process of integrating that data is much easier to do in a cloud platform. And then there's better, better data security and disaster recovery. Uh, you know, with your cloud application, it's in a it's in a, a large data center being manned by teams of security experts. It's not just the probably shorthanded IT team that you have in house. And these are people that are dedicated to world class security 24/7. Okay, so that's that's your business case on, on how you might go to management or really start the process for, for being able to move some of these applications to the cloud. Uh, first steps after that, identify one or two apps that can benefit most greatly from the cloud. And we're, we're not going to boil the ocean. We don't want to try and move everything at once. But identify just one or two applications that you know, maybe they're you know, like, gosh, this application, if we had this on a mobile device, it would be so powerful. Or this other application, gosh, you know, users, they can't stand it, and it's taking so long for that team to enter, track, and report on their data. So start with one or two. Is it GXP or non-GXP? And as David talked about, you're okay either way. Cloud systems can be validated. So it's kind of a new um, you know, a fairly new area in validating cloud applications, and don't let that be a deterrent to moving to the cloud because it's you know, GXP or non-GXP, it's fine. Uh, you can do it and be successful, and make sure that the FDA were to to audit you on your cloud system. You know, if you had that validation expertise in house. And they would handle that if you wanted to outsource that to a third party validation group, but they would provide you with the documentation you needed to feel safe in using a cloud system for in a in a GXP business area. You would then assess your in-house expertise, like I just mentioned. Uh, you'd want to identify the platform that you're going to use, whether it's something like Salesforce, Oracle, SAP, or other uh, you know, business area specific applications. Make sure that you find out which one is going to work best for your business requirement. And then use existing apps or custom build your application. So with something like Salesforce, they have an app exchange where there's lots of existing apps. You get into kind of the build versus buy question. Uh, and then once you do that, you are on your way to using the cloud, and having a connected enterprise. Okay. Becky, I'm going to hand it back to you. Terrific. Thank you, gentlemen. So we will open the floor for questions now. I'll give you a moment just to type those in. And while you're doing that, I would like to let you know that the webinar has been recorded and will be available on our website, which is of course usdm.com. I uh, recognize quite a few of the names on the call, and I know that many of you are familiar with uh, USDM capabilities in compliance projects, but did you know that USDM offers three different delivery options? The first one, as I mentioned, our projects team, which supports start to finish compliance across the uh, various practices that we addressed earlier. Each project is led by our subject matter expert practice directors and or a uh, subject matter expert project manager utilizing our USDM team members with various skill sets. So based on client preference, we can be very flexible and we can be available to work on site or remotely uh, to be most cost effective. And we also are good about sharing the different skill sets so you don't have the project manager uh, doing the technical writing, etc. So uh, we've got quite a bit of experience there. 
If, on the other hand, you need an extra pair of hands to meet your project deadlines, USDM can support staff augmentation where we can uh, offer your um, internally managed projects team solid team members that uh, bring different skill sets to the table uh, with experience uh, specifically geared to the project you are undertaking. The ultimate goal there is uh, for USDM uh, client delight because we know that results in repeat business and excellent referrals. The uh, third option is USDM on demand, which is a blended on-site, onshore, offshore model, and that's for managed services, uh, highly you know development and support, and the validation testing. So this approach incorporates the cost savings of offshoring while reducing the risk, ensuring higher success than the traditional offshoring. Happy to share more about any one of those directly. And with that, it looks like we do have uh, questions coming in there. Uh, the first one looks like it's for David. Uh, since the connected enterprise extends down to the mobile device, what is the process for validating mobile applications and devices? Okay, thanks, Becky. Um, okay, that's a great question. There's one we I, I actually hear that a lot with uh, some of our clients and prospective clients. So in essence, mobile device validation process should be included with your, your main system validation plan. But in essence, it can be treated like its own mini uh, risk-based system validation, if you like, uh, with inclusion of the integrations to the, the, the parent cloud platform or the master system, you know, such as the Salesforce, for example. Um, so initially, you'll perform an IQ on your hardware and your software for the device. Um, using the specified operating system version that you want to use and the specified hardware and application software versions as well. Uh, and while it's best to physically prevent users, if you can, uh, from upgrading to new versions of the OS, uh, that's not always feasible. So if you can't physically prevent them to do that, you want to um, have your training policies and SOPs mandate that your staff don't uh, take the OS and you know when Apple or Android issues an upgrade. Um, they go ahead and really need to do it themselves. So you want to you want to have that as a policy if you can't physically prevent that. And it's been I've seen it done either way. Um, the, the functional and user acceptance testing they're, they're performed in the same manner as for the main parent system. But of course you want to make sure you include testing for the integrations to that master system. Um, and uh, of course there's other things that you need to consider, such as you know, whether it's going to be real time automatically synchronized as data is inserted, whether it's an offline manual sync or, or it's a combination of both uh, you know, where you might be in the bowels of a hospital somewhere where, where networks not always possible or, or available. Um, so furthermore, you know, some of the most important considerations around security with mobile devices, um, depending on the, on the risk that's related to the, the type of information that you have available uh, on that device, um, you know, some devices are going to have lots of patient data embedded within them on the applications, and others are just, you know, services um, of a device or a mid device somewhere. Um, so they only have serial numbers, etc. So, depending on the risk, you want to have, you know, maybe um, install and verify your your passcodes and biometric access systems, um, just in case, you know, so someone should misplace or, or you know, the, um, that device actually gets stolen. Obviously, they are a lot more mobile and easily accessible. So security has to be a concern and, and validated at, at, in the, to the same standards to make sure you're, you're compliant. Um, so in essence, that's, that's hopefully that answers that question. Um, if there's any more questions on that, please send them along. Absolutely. Thank you so much, David. Okay, our next question, it looks like it's for Brian. Um, when looking to migrate a legacy application to the cloud, how much historical data on average do companies need to bring into the new system? Sure. So um, you know, there's no one answer to that question, but I'll speak to the process around data migration. So, um, you know, I, I would ask these questions. When you're working in the new system, do you need access to legacy data uh, at your fingertips in real time, uh, or is it something that you can maybe retrieve uh, later in the day or later in the process? And the reason for that is, is because a lot of companies, they might maintain access to their older system and keep the data in there, <clears throat> but they don't want to clutter the new system 
with that data. You know, maybe they, they're, they're really looking at different data points. Uh, they're, you know, the older data may not be clean or, or valuable anymore with, with their new processes. Um, you never want to delete that data. You, know, you always want to keep it around. But um, as far as bringing it into the new system, again, if it's something that you need, say you're a customer service group, and you're getting, your customers are asking to reference older tickets or issues or complaints that come up. Of course, you're going to need to move that data into the new system. Um, and then you can also look at how far do you go back. You know, maybe you've had the legacy system for 10 years, but you really ever only need to go back for three years or four years or maybe even five years. So that's where you would establish a cutoff point. You would, you would group the legacy data that you want to bring in. You would make sure that it's as clean as possible. You don't want to bring dirty data into a new system. So you would extract it from the legacy system. You would do transformation of that data. That's the, that's the cleaning it up and filling in blank fields and things like that. Maybe in the new system you have some fields that are required that weren't required in the older ones, so you have to fill in that data. And then you would load it into the new system. So again, there's no right answer as to the amount of legacy data that you need to bring in. It's really the process that you want to follow, and that is how, how quickly do you need access to that data, and how far back do you need to go. Thank you, Brian. Very good. It looks like our next question coming in <laughs> addresses the fear factor, which I think is a really large uh, challenge for uh, many companies these days. Um, the question says, uh, the biggest fear for life science companies is the security of a hosted data. How are you specifically addressing that? Yeah, I, I'll, this is Brian. I'll, I'll start, and certainly if anyone has anything else to add, please do. Um, this is a great question, and we hear it all the time, and I actually love answering it, because the, the fear around security of hosted data, um, you know, these data centers and, and these cloud providers, they have to adhere to very strict uh, regulations as well on how they, um, how they store their data, how customers are accessing it, the architecture that they need to adhere to. Uh, you know, at USDM, we audit these cloud providers. We audit Salesforce and make sure that their data centers and all of their systems are compliant. So that you know, and, and again, they have teams of world-class security experts who are um, maintaining that these systems are, are running efficiently and, and the way they need to be 24 hours a day. Now, as far as being a user of a cloud system and accessing that data, the transmission of it, it's all HTTPS. It's all secure transmission, so you, you don't have to have any fears there. Hopefully that answered that question. And, and also that the architecture of the data itself being multi-tenant, um, you know, your data does not reside on one system that's, that can be compromised. Your data is spread around to many different systems, therefore making it harder to compromise that data. Yeah, I think, Brian, the, 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 um, the, the last point you made there is, is great. The, if you have, you know, if you have your own data center that you're using, or, or you're utilizing somebody else's data center as a third party, your data all resides in one place. So, um, you know, there is, there has been some recent examples of people, you know, gaining access to data, um, you know, hacking into data. Once you get into the that data center or that server, you've pretty much got access to everything within it. And of course, within the cloud, as Brian said, it's multi-tenant. It's, it's segmented around multiple different servers spread throughout you know, the country or, or you know, even, even, uh, even further. So getting access to data becomes a lot more difficult, and um, it, it, it becomes even you know, uh, almost a mute point because 
um, that fear is, is kind of can be turned on its head. It's, it's actually less dangerous than it would be in, in its own hosted server. Because so, the, the same security measures apply to the cloud as they would to a hosted server, but the data is in different places. So it, even if they do get in, they only get you know, a very, very small amount. Very good. Thank you, gentlemen. So yeah, and to add to that, you know, we are happy to connect with your team just in working through the reality of what, do, what would your project look like if you and you know, your management team, you're trying to decide if this is a good idea or what, what am I really facing with this challenge. We are happy to uh, connect with you in just a brief conversation just to kind of work that through and, uh, and to have that one-on-one -on -one call with your team to share our insight and maybe, you know, um, put some of those fears to rest. It's uh, funny, USDM, I've uh, been with the team about 10 years now and, and uh, continually on the leading edge, right? So every new forefront of technology, we're there first to kind of solve the problems and work that through. And then our goal is to bring those answers and solutions directly to you. So don't hesitate to reach out and let us be able to do that. I think with that, we will wrap up the presentation today. Thank you all again for uh, joining us in, in teaming in the information sharing. I would encourage you to visit the USDM website. You can find much more information there. And uh, look for the next three um, presentations in this series. They're on the website as we speak. You can register there and partake as well. Also, please do join the discussion on LinkedIn. You can stay up to date with upcoming events there and presentations as well. Let us know that we're on the right track. Your feedback is very valuable. And we do uh, take your suggestions to heart. Let us know if there's a future presentation topic. If there's a pain point we can help you address, let us know. We're happy to uh, give it a shot. If you um, have any specific needs, don't hesitate to send over an email or give us a call. Thank you gentlemen all for presenting today. And uh, we do appreciate this opportunity to team with you in working towards excellence and compliance. Have a wonderful day.